Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog, and today we have more King and Black tie-in issues. I'm going to try to get through these as fast as I can over the next few episodes so we can get to the Space Knight stuff, and, uh, and then also try to finish a Carnage week and get all that done by the end of May, uh, because I'm hoping for, you know, ho you know, hopefully some more movie news around June and July. So I'm trying to get through a lot of this comic book stuff uh, as fast as I can. So, uh, so Cam Frazier, thank you so much for donating these issues to us today. Uh, Cam donated four of these issues, and then one of them I went and picked up myself, but I told Cam I was going to do that because I'm a big fan of Beta Ray Bill, and I wanted to uh, read the book myself. So I have a physical copy of this, so we will give out the digital code for this later on in the episode because this will be the last book we discuss. Uh, because first up, we have four issues of Return of the Valkyries, uh, which is the first series or the, the main series we're going to talk about in this episode. And then at the very end, we'll get to the Beta Ray Bill episode. So uh, so this, you know, I have the credits up there. This is by Jason Aaron and uh, Tarun Grombeck. Uh, hopefully I'm sp uh, pronouncing your name right, Tarun. And uh, Nina Vakiva is the artist on this book. Um, and this series started off really neat because it starts off with bob uh you know our friend well actually it starts off and you kind of see a battle happening then it cuts to a scene with bob where jane foster shows up and sees the sentry's soul essentially and she's like hey uh, you know what's going on and he's like oh my name is sentry i go you know my name is bob i go by the sentry and i was trying to protect earth and i i, I screwed up i went in hot-headed i guess and went up against something super powerful it ripped me in half and uh you know and i died and He's like, you know, the crazy thing is, is, you know, your life actually flashes before your eyes when you die. And it showed me like mostly good stuff, you know, like mostly the good that I've done in this world. Um, and then they like insert this like lame joke where they're like, he's like, he, well, actually it starts off kind of sweet where he's like, oh, this one time I made my wife laugh. And he goes, and that was a memory I had. But then they like inserted like, oh, I made her laugh so hard that she peed a little bit. And you're like, okay, what? <laughs> like, like, I know that's a phrase and, and possibly something that's happened to people, I guess. Um, but again, like, I don't know, I just thought it, it took me out of the moment. I was like, oh, that's kind of sweet. He remembers making his wife laugh like one time because maybe he was always kind of stoic and never good at jokes. And so I was like, oh, this is kind of sweet. And then they, you know, Jason Aaron ended up because <laughs> uh, Jason Aaron is like the co-writer of this. So I don't know how much Jason Aaron's influence on it is, but I feel like most of the bad jokes that were in this felt very Jason Aaron-y. I could be wrong about that. It could be, uh, you know, the other writers, uh, um, you know, influence on it. But uh, but I thought, I wish they just didn't say. What, and then later they explained, she was like, what joke did you say to make your wife laugh? And he explained it. And it's just kind of like, it was like a really terrible joke, like something about boiling water or something. So, uh, so yeah, knock it off. You're not very good at tone jokes. <laughs> Please don't put those in anymore. Because they kept taking me out of it. I felt like this book was like, borderline like sincerity and, and kind of fun and and it had moments of levity but they weren't for like the, those were the moments that i didn't feel like were forced the joke thing i felt like okay you're you're forcing this uh but the stuff that you naturally have between the characters where there's some levity that works so like so that was kind of my only issue with this is that they it was almost like they were like oh i gotta make it you know funnier in some way or you know whatever or maybe even maybe they were even going for bad jokes and cringe but I, don't do that like you know t t uh, for at least for me it took me out of the story but you know maybe you guys feel differently but uh but i did like kind of the setup it's like okay this is sentry's soul and he has to go to the afterlife very simple premise uh jane has to take sentry soul to valhalla awesome like because he went down fighting you know like against uh null and stuff um so okay so he has to go to valhalla and then along the way there's complications uh, the complication being something that I found interesting. And again, this is me probably um, projecting something or or not like this may not be accurate. So this is just my opinion. Um, but there's something in this book where they set up where, you know, like Noel has that like in between world where all the souls are and stuff like that. Well, Noel also is tied to the first celestial he ever killed. And that celestial uh, that he chopped the head off of way back at the beginning of time, its body is still out there and since celestials don't really have an afterlife to go to when they die because they don't really they're not really meant to die this one created its own afterlife and it's been trapping beings in it uh throughout the years like uh you know like different like uh for example uh the valkyrie the original valkyrie uh brihilda or whatever she's uh she's one of the um 
you know, souls that are trapped in here. And she she's constantly like, while we're cutting from Jane and Bob, we're cutting to her, um, and Brunhilde. I I'm, I'm, think I'm butchering her name too, uh, so I apologize. Uh, but she's like the original Valkyrie. I think the one that's more based off of uh, Tessa Thompson, because I know the original Valkyrie was like, you know, not that. She had blonde hair and like pale skin. But like um, this one is like more like Tessa Thompson. So she's like a, an older Valkyrie. And she's uh, in this world where she's with her true love, you know, the woman she fell in love with. And she's like stuck there and she's starting to piece together that it's not real. In fact, she's almost completely convinced herself that it's not real. But because it's so nice to be with the woman she loves again, she's just giving in. Like she's just like, whatever, I know it's not real, but I'd rather have this than nothing. And I thought that was interesting. <laughs> so it was like going back and forth with two, two interesting things, but then just like, convoluting it with sometimes well the bad jokes don't convolute it but they were just kind of like took me out of it for a minute but then they would just do these other things that just i felt like slowed down those two interesting stories um i did like the stuff with uh hildy uh hildegrad i think her name is and um uh, danny moonstone um or moonstar sorry uh from new mutants i liked that kind of stuff like th those were neat and they kind of set up danny to maybe be a valkyrie you know and become like one of them as well so and then I think there was a point where um, Hildy had to like go and sacrifice herself like against Null because she was like, "Look, I need to buy my friend's time." Jane lost the soul of um, of Bob because he got sucked into the Celestial. So like I said, the Celestial created its own purgatory world and it's been trapping people and souls there over you know generations, and so um, Bob has been sucked into there. So Jane has to go in and get him, but she first goes and tries to get some help first from other Valkyries. She finds uh, the first Valkyrie, you know, finds her, and then also finds uh, uh, Hildegrad, or I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> yeah, what's, whatever, Hildy, I'll just call her Hildy. Um, so she's like finding these other Valkyries, and, and you know, they some of them team up, like I said, with Danny Moonstar. Um, and then there's one that's like an old woman who's like uh, knitting together realities uh, that can never exist or something, and they go and talk to her, and she's like an ancient Valkyrie, and they're like, we need to gather the Valkyries here in Valhalla, we need to like gather the remaining souls of the Valkyries and go help fight this King in Black thing. Um, so, so there's all these like elements dancing around, but like, I felt like they're, oh, those are interesting, but they don't like do a ton with them in these four issues. They try to balance it and they don't really balance it really well. I feel like maybe if they split this over two series, this could have been better. You could have done like a three issue with Jane Foster and, uh, and Bob, and you could have done a three issue with something else. Not like I'm saying, I want more tie-ins to this, but you, sometimes you gotta do what's best for the story and the characters. And I felt like this was just too many characters um, kind of jumbled into four issues, but there was still enough here to where I, I kind of at least enjoyed the, the, the journey they were on. So, uh, so Jane's like, okay, you guys battle, you know, the Valkyries show up, everyone's teaming up fighting against, uh, you know, Null and, and everything. And he's like, there's like Null on earth and there's like the Null spiritual Null, you know, and then there's also the celestial whose consciousness is still there. And it's trying to, prevent people from uh coming in and out of its realm this purgatory that it's created because that's disrupting everything it's it's causing everyone whose souls are in that realm to start to realize that they're not really in you know they're not in the real world um or they're not in like a real afterlife so uh so jane goes in after bob and when she's in there she sees the soul of her son of course it's not really her son it's like an echo of his soul from her memories so she tests it and once she realizes she like says humpty dumpty something and once the kid responds differently than the way the kid would have in the real world before, you know, Jimmy passed away, um, or Johnny, I can't remember, it starts with a J. Um, but her son, his like, she can tell, hey, this is not really my son. So, uh, so, so she's like, okay, uh, Celestial, we need to talk. And so she, Jane has this like one-on-one -on -one conversation with the Celestial while everyone else is fighting. And I do like Danny Moonstar. She has this moment where she says, what if we can go and prove our worthiness to null maybe he'll spare us and they're like uh no he's already decimated like tons of worlds and then danny's like oh okay well then let's just go fight him and i was like oh that that could have been something you could have developed and then have it crush danny later but it's like literally all done in like one page and i was like so again i just feel like there's a lot of things here that maybe could have worked if they were fleshed out a little bit um but uh, but overall like these four issues aren't bad i think they mainly exist to set up the new Valkyrie book, which is out now called The Mighty Valkyries. So it's more for that and less about King and Black. But what I liked is that there's very little dragon fighting in this. And what I was saying earlier, what I was starting to say, and I, I got, got sidetracked, which is um, they actually add to the lore, uh, kind of, uh, by making the Celestial have its own 
spiritual realm, they kind of add to the lore of the King and Black story overall, and that this is like this pocket purgatory where people are going, including Bob, who just got killed. He gets sucked into that world before he could go to Valhalla, where he's supposed to go. Um, and so I, I kind of liked all that, because I think that actually adds something genuine to the whole King and Black Null mythos and everything. Um, I thought that added something to it. And of course it would, because Jason Aaron and Donnie Cates are buddies, so I'm sure they probably did exchange an email or a phone call, whereas Donnie, it doesn't seem like he spent any time talking to any of the other writers, or neither did the editor talk to most of the other writers doing tie-ins. They were just like, here, throw a dragon in your story. This felt like it was trying to add more to it. And I was like, well, of course it would. It's like a bias. Like, it's like, hey, you know, Jason Aaron's my friend. So his book should have a little bit more substance than the other books. And I just was like, eh. Uh, so again, I may be projecting and, and you know, whatever there, but uh, but that's what it felt like when I was reading it. I was like, oh yeah, Jason Aaron's his buddy. So, uh, and they exchange like, you know, ideas all the time, uh, which is probably why I'm not a fan of really either of their writings most of the time. Yet I like this story and like some of Donnie's stuff we've talked about in the Venom stuff. I see the potential. Like these guys are good writers, I think you know defaultly good writers but then they get these ideas and they get these things and they go kind of crazy and then there's no one there to really like bounce creatively with them other than each other like so jason and, and Don, donnie it sounds like from you know listening to a few of uh donnie's podcasts that he just calls jason and they'll or email him and they'll talk about ideas i guess they're you know and they're friends and stuff so to me i'm just like ah you know i, I can see you two talk during this a little bit uh but more so than you know donnie talked to others and again i could i'm could be just talking out of my ass with that i'm just telling you how it felt while i was reading this so every time i got pulled out of the story it was for these reasons where i'm like i'm like wow this has more depth to it as far as like connections to null than most of the other tie-ins we've read so it just feels it just and then i was like well who's writing it again oh jason aaron i'm like he's like a co-writer so i'm like oh yeah that makes sense like they're you know i think they're friends so um so yeah so there's a little bit of that but i but overall like the story itself is like like a typical jason aaron story there's beats in it where i'm like okay this is not bad and stuff but um and he he does write jane pretty well like i like how he writes the character and there's some humanity in this like with the you know seeing loved ones in the afterlife like each character has their moments and actually hildy towards the end when she's willing to sacrifice herself to fight Noel, she gets consumed by um the the symbiotes and she says you know i thought in the end i would scream and go down screaming you know and bleeding and she's like but uh, I'm not. She's like, at the end, I just feel love. And so she's like, the, the suits are like consuming her and she's not fighting it anymore because she's already used the best weapon she could against Null and it didn't work. So she's kind of like, but she did set up the thing. So she threw like this thread around Null and his weapon. And they're thinking if they can separate the uh, the blade from Null, it'll like weaken his grip on everything to an extent. And especially this afterlife realm where, you know, sentries being held his soul's being held so they kind of have that big plan where they're like oh maybe it can weaken Noel in the real world if we take the sword away from him but it'll also weaken his hold and uh and attachment to this celestial afterlife world uh that he inadvertently created as well and so she set that up she sends the thread around it and then goes down you know with the symbiotes coming over and when she says that like i only feel love at the end i'm like i like that like that was another again a good moment and uh I actually really like the characters like that's what I got to say my one takeaway from this is even though it had it was choppy and messy at times like I wouldn't mind reading more adventures of these characters maybe under a different writer but uh but I definitely I think but I think Mighty Valkyries is actually written by the same two people so I don't know maybe that's enough maybe without the tie-in of King and Black um maybe I, I, maybe I'll go give that book a chance but I, I don't know I, I'll probably wait till Comixology does like a graphic novel sale of it for like Two ninety nine or three ninety nine, just buy it that way. Um, but I, I'm intrigued. I mean, I actually ended up liking some of these characters, like Hildy and and having the original or having the the Tessa Thompson looking Valkyrie come in um, and Jane. Like, I, I, yeah, I mean, the, like, there's enough there to where I'm like, I like this. I mean, it's. I always say like when when I usually when I try to write like female characters and stuff, I try not to think of them as female characters. I just try to think of them as characters. So I'll go like, uh, all right, well, in, in this situation male or female i think it makes sense for the character to do this or do that and then if the character happens to be male or female it just to me it feels more natural because you're just thinking well this is the the mentality of this type of person this is like their how their brain works and, and this is how they react in certain situations 
doesn't matter if they're a man or a woman, this is how they, they would react. Um, and then you tell the story that way. I, I kind of got a little bit of that in this, and I liked that. That made me feel like, okay, you're not just writing a book about, you know, women teaming up for the sake of women teaming up. Like there's a, there's a reason for some of these things, and you're not writing them specifically with like where they have to remind you every page that they're women they're just kicking ass the whole time and i, I kind of like that there's a couple moments with that but not a ton and so i like that so overall like valkyrie um return of the valkyrie one through four um i liked this series i, I thought i you know i i had a couple hiccups and a couple problems but overall i thought it was it had heart to it and it had a little bit of humanity to it and i thought these uh women in the book like kicked ass like i just thought they did i wasn't a huge fan of the art some in some pages it was better than others so the art was a little inconsistent for me but um but luckily the like the colors and stuff made the some of the pages that i didn't think the line work was good on still made them pop a little bit and so i i like that and then there was a lot of good big shots with like Jane Foster with her wings, like flying and, you know, uh, a Valkyrie, um, you know, on her ho horse with the wings. And, and she's like, uh, when did Valkyries get wings? And she's like, Jane's like, I'm the first one. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so yeah, it was, it was kind of neat. Um, so I, overall, not bad, actually. Um, a couple things, I, you know, that they could have tweaked and stuff, but I think there's enough here to where I might want to read more of these characters later on, um, especially Hildy. I think I liked her the most. I thought she was just like, she's part of the Warriors 3, I think, the new Warriors 3. And she, because um, I don't really know, I haven't followed and kept up with a lot of the Valkyrie stuff or the Jane Foster stuff. So a lot of this was new to me. That's why I'm kind of bad with the names and everything. It's just like, there was a lot of new stuff being thrown at me in this series. But uh, but I, I think her name was Hildy. She's like she's like the big burly one. And she was just awesome like I, and i love that moment at the end when she was like i didn't go down screaming or you know or wailing um you know in a battle like in a rage I, she's like I'm, I'm surrounded by love right now because i know that what i'm doing here is going to help my friends up there and so she threw that thread around null sword and then later you know jane and all of them pulled that thread or the other valkyries show up and uh from valhalla and pull that thread and they're able to sever that connection long enough to where jane and the valkyrie can get um you know bob's soul out and also communicate with the celestial and get it to undo its world and allow all those souls to go to where they're supposed to go um so i liked that i thought that was really big and i thought that meant this story had something to say like maybe it wasn't exactly king and black tied in um but it, in a way it was because it it's it talked about that celestial from way back in you know the early pages of venom where donny cates explained Noel's backstory um so it kind of wrapped that thread up and it didn't it wasn't just valkyries fighting dragons there was a little bit of that on earth with danny moonstar and uh and you know hildy and stuff but just a little bit of it so for that this one gets points so i, I did I, I really enjoyed this um so now let's get to the last issue for this episode which is beta ray bill now this one uh was a lot like you know most tie-ins um but it still had a story to tell so i kind of like that um again i haven't kept up with a lot of the Sif and Beta Ray Bill stuff. Uh, Sif has an appearance in the Valkyrie book, by the way, and it's really great. Um, but in this one, she has an appearance because her and um, you know Beta Ray Bill were in love at one point. And by the way, before we get into this, because we're gonna talk about spoilers, if you want the digital code, boom, there's a digital code right there. First person to put that in gets a copy of Beta Ray Bill number one digitally. So enjoy that. I uh, hope you enjoy the book because this one, written by Daniel Warren Johnson and uh, Mike Spicer is the artist is uh oh, i'm sorry daniel warren johnson is the writer and artist and mike spicer is the color artist on this one so um so yeah i thought really well done job it, it kind of gives you a peek at beta ray bill he talks about his life who he was you know before he was able to lift mjolnir uh for those who don't know beta ray bill is the uh, first character in marvel continuity other than thor to lift the hammer of uh mjolnir so um so yeah, and he's got like this cool like horse face, like horse skull face. Um, and you know, he's kind of, you know, some people would say ugly. I think he's badass. Uh, and he is romantically involved with Sif, but that's only because at one point when he was able to lift Mjolnir um, or lift, uh, you know, one of the weapons that Thor had, it was able to revert him to a good looking form. So, um, so him and Sif kind of, um, you know, hooked up you know during that time in that in the comics i think that was in a journey into mystery i think that was sif's comic um so he's remembering those times 
but he now can no longer lift uh, the, that weapon because it was destroyed, uh, Mjolnir. So, um, or not Mjolnir, but like whatever the other weapon was that he, he could lift. Um, so that gave him his powers. It like turned him back um, and made him look like a handsome guy so that Sif would, you know, hook up with him, I guess. And he fell in love with Sif and she fell in love with that version of him. And that's what I kind of liked was I love Sif as a character, but they don't really do a ton with her um interestingly like as far as a character goes and i kind of like this character flaw where she's a little um shallow i i, I kind of like that i don't agree with it sure but like I, it's something to the character so so when she sees beta ray bill she's kind of like hey so like you know you're gonna turn back into your other form like you know, i'm off duty right now and maybe we can spend the night together and he doesn't answer her and he's like now thinking back to this battle where he was fighting thing thing foom who has been possessed by null like a symbiote so this is really the only tie-in so they're doing a, the typical oh you have a dragon to fight in your tie-in but this is at least a thing thing foom dragon you know possessed by a, a symbiote so um so so sif and uh, beta ray bill they're fighting the living crap out of this thing uh, it's throwing sh spaceships around it's like you know fighting everybody and they're taking this fight to him and they end up winning and striking him down with lightning but only because thor shows up like thor shows up and in and takes out Beta Ray Bill, but I mean, takes out, I'm um, sorry, Fing Fang Foom. And he even says, he's like, uh, that's weird. He's like, you could have taken Fing Fang Foom anytime. He's like, symbiote or not. He's like, so why are you struggling? And Beta Ray Bill is pissed at Thor. He's like, because my, you took my weapon and it's destroyed now. And now I can't turn into my old self. I don't have the power I used to. So it's one of those stories where it's like, um, they're going on that journey like they do with Iron Man sometimes where it's like, are you the man or the suit, you know? And they've done that where Tony said that to Spider-Man in one of the movies, like, are you the man or the suit? Um, you know, Captain America, are you the man or the shield or the symbol? Like, what are you? And that's kind of what they're doing with here with Beta Ray Bill. Is he the hammer that gave him those powers and turned him into a good looking guy so he could hook up with a hot girl? Is he that? Or is he, is there something more to him, you know, underneath? And that seems to be the story they're telling. So I will definitely keep buying this book because I want to see what journey they take uh, beta ray bill on but after which by the way i don't understand in the timeline when this happens because if, if thor's on earth fighting no how can he be here helping uh beta ray bill stop a thing thing foom uh possessed dragon in space thing so i'm a little like <laughs> and actually i don't even think they're in space i think they're actually on earth so i'm i'm a little confused that maybe this is like when thor's on his way to go fight no but yet he has moments to sit and gloat for a minute which seems weird. Like, I feel like he would get right to fighting Null. So again, timeline-wise, like this doesn't make really any sense. And you could pretty much pluck the symbiote thing right out of the story and just have him fight Fing Fang Foom without the Null possession and then have Thor show up. And you could have said this happened after King in Black. There's no reason to say this to King. In fact, they don't even put the King in Black dressing on it, which is why Cam, I don't think, bought this book. Um, uh, or maybe he did by now. I don't know. But uh, but that's why, you know, I wanted it because it's Beta Ray Bill and I want to read a story about Beta Ray Bill. But yeah, that's literally the only null reference on the cover is the spiral on Fing Fang Foom's head. But if you just took the symbiote off him, this story doesn't change. So once again, it just feels like a hollow tie-in, but at least they didn't super advertise it as a tie-in on the cover. Um, unless they did on one of the variant covers, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but at least they didn't on this one too much other than the spiral. So at the end, you know, we have Beta Ray Bill talking to Sif. And she's like, okay, well, let's, you know, what's the deal? Are we going to go to my room or what? And uh, he picks her up and he's about to take her into the room. He takes off his shirt. I'm not going to show you the artwork because, <laughs> you know, well, I guess I'll show you this page. So he takes off his uh, shirt and everything because he's still a ripped dude. Um, and uh, she's like, okay, so, you know, how's this going to work? And he's, she's like, what do you mean? And she's like, you're human form. Like, are you going to transform into it? Like, you know, what's going on here? And he goes, oh, uh, you know, I, I can't, you know, um, ever since Donald Blake robbed me of Odin's enchantment, that's what it was. His uh, weapon is no longer enchanted because of Donald Blake. So I'm not really reading the Thor books right now, so I don't know what's going on over there. So apparently that happened over there. So he's like, yeah, I, I'm, I can't turn back into the human form that you kind of fell in love with. And so she's like, oh, okay. And then he's like, oh, oh, what? And she's like, well, look, I'm, I, she's like, I don't want to sound harsh. She goes, but I, I, I can't, you know, be with you intimately in your, in this form, this like horse face, creepy form. Uh, and he's like, ah, uh, okay. And he's like, so, and again, I don't mean to like say that she's shallow. I mean, I'm glad they didn't put a horse guy 
and her hooking up romantically in this book. I don't think the book needed that either. Um, but I do, but I mean shallow in the sense that um, handsome, like she liked his, his human form because she felt it was handsome. And so she cares more about that form than the guy inside, technically. Um, even if he's like a horse face guy, uh, but I still, I still liked that like message of like him going like, okay. And that moment of a sift, like, again, maybe I don't agree with it, but characters are meant to have flaws. And sometimes, you know, you read a lot in comics nowadays where they don't always give characters flaws, um, particularly female characters. Sometimes, uh, writers are afraid to do something with female characters that an audience might not agree with. And her kind of being like a little shallow, um, or I should say particular, <laughs> she's a little particular. Um, he, uh, you know, he, it adds a little something to her as a character. I, I like that. I think that's neat. Uh, I mean, again, I may not agree with what she's doing, but the, I agree with the act of giving her a point of view on something like this. So, um, so she's like, yeah, I can't be with you. And so he goes, okay. And he goes to his ship, the scuttle button. He's like, uh, prep the engines, you know, we're, we're going to leave this, this place and, uh, we're going to go find, who we are you know we're going to find a new weapon uh, we're going to find a new lease on life we're going to find ourselves and so it seems like for the next four issues it's going to be kind of a spiritual journey and i like that i'm, I'm interested and I'm, I'm curious to see if sif will factor into the rest of the story and um and if they'll build some kind of relationship where it's just not physical like i mean to me i'm like you could do that in a comic book they can still be in love with each other and and not you know, she can kiss him on the cheek or something like you know, but I don't know, but she's like a warrior. So she's about like killing and screwing <laughs> a little bit. So, so maybe, maybe, but that, then that could bring some change in her character where she's learning to, you know, ha, you know, have a more of an emotional connection than, than a physical one. So I don't know. I'm, I'm curious to see where they go with this, but uh, I just thought it was a neat setup. It was a pretty decent issue. The art's pretty good too. Um, but it just didn't need to be King and Black related at all. <laughs> I just didn't need that. Um, but those are my thoughts. So, you know, you guys let me know, what did you think of the Valkyrie series? What did you think of Beta Ray Bill? Have you read these? Um, if so, let me know down in the comments. And if you haven't, you have any questions, things I didn't cover, uh, feel free to, you know, drop those in the comments too. And we'll continue the conversation as always down there. And I have well, at least one more video I'm going to record, um, you know, for Cam Frazier, the more donations he sent, which is going to be Namor one through five. I'm going to do that next. And I'll try to get these videos out to you guys very, very soon. So thanks so much for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff, and I'll see you in the future. Peace.